friends, this is the Be Real Babe podcast, a place where your average babes come together to talk about life stresses, messes, and successes. A place where being yourself is the ultimate goal, where your opinion, your story, and your individual experience matters. Join me, your host B, and my guests for real and raw talks every week, laying it all out there so we can all help each other learn more, grow deeper, and evolve collectively. Now keep in mind, as a disclaimer, no one here is an expert and no one is giving any advice. This is strictly our opinions, thoughts, feelings, and for entertainment purposes only. Now with that being said, it's time. So grab your drink, grab your joint, and let's jump right in. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Be Real Babe podcast. If this is your first time here, thank you so much for stopping by the show today. I hope that you have a good time. And if you're a returning listener, watcher, supporter, thank you guys so, so much from the bottom of my heart for coming back time and time again. For those that don't know me, my name is Brandy. I am the host of the show. And today, guys, we're on episode 187, Being Real with Amber, author of The Obedient Daughter. You guys, I'm so excited for you to hear this amazing interview. I cannot wait for you to hear it. But before we get on to the show, I'd just like to remind you, if you're watching on YouTube and Rumble, so Subscribe, like, and turn on those notifications if you can. Make sure to comment. Helps your girl out quite a bit. And if you're listening to Spotify or Apple, you can also turn on notifications and leave me a review if you're feeling so kind. And if you want to find me on social media, again, a very, very sensitive topic, you can find me at the Be Real Babe podcast on Instagram, possibly on Pinterest, and the Be Real Collective maybe on Facebook. I don't know, you guys, I'm getting hammered hard at the end of the season, but we are still here, we're still recording, we're still playing, and we're not booted off of any platforms that run the podcast. So that is amazing. So you guys, I'm very excited for you to get into this episode, and I cannot believe we're on the final stretch, the last couple episodes of season seven. I just want to thank you guys, as always, for liking, supporting, doing all the things that you guys do. It's absolutely insane that you guys are still listening, even though it's just little old me. Um, So as always, just... Thank you guys again from the bottom of my heart. Let's finish season seven strong AF. I will take a break and your girl will be back in September for season eight while I take most of July and August off, have a little siesta, enjoy the weather, and then come back for the depressing months of fall. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We're not, we're not going to have seasonal depression this year. I hope. All right, guys, let's get into the episode. All right, babes, it's time to get on to the show. And with me today, I have a very special guest joining me for her first time. She's the author of The Obedient Daughter coming out this fall. I'd like to welcome Amber Hayes to the show. Hey, babe, how's it going? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm so excited to talk to you today. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. It means so much, dude. Like, when people reach out to me, I literally will scream and, like, throw my phone and uh, and message my fiance. I'm like, someone wants to come on my show. They haven't spoken before. (laughs) Like, before we get started, just, like, thank you for reaching out. Like, um, it's my favorite thing on planet Earth. I don't love social media, but those messages, I'm like, hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. It's so funny because I feel exactly the same way. I, I I absolutely hate social media. I think it's such a vulnerable place to be in. And when you get somebody who is so reciprocating of being able to tell and share these stories, I'm just so grateful. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, girl, I just, yes, please, when? Sign me up tomorrow. Okay, let's go. <laughs> and, and I get really excited too when it's like Canadian, Alberta, right next to, oh my God, we're neighbors. We're now best friends. <laughs> that so, never happens. Oh no, I love that. Well, I'm spoiling a little bit, guys. So before we get into um, your new book and how you got there, let's start, back it up a little bit. Let's start with the basics and just um, share a little bit about yourself to the listeners if you can. Sure. So I am a mother of two girls. My girls are 10 and seven, very sassy, very crazy, busy, busy time. Um, I was born in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I went to school there, went to university there and ended up moving out to Calgary and getting started here. Um, I'll share a little bit about the book in a bit, but um, I was with a previous husband. We got divorced, found my current husband, had my two girls. Um, I was working in the corporate world for a decade, kind of took everything that I learned from there and decided to start my own business. I feel like when when you start to care more about what, say, the presentations look like or what the office space looks like instead of what's the actual content in Mm -hmm. there, I feel like it's it's like a sign that's telling you to kind of pick up and move on. And, And so I started my own interior design company And uh, yeah, so I specialize in children's design, but I also do um, full home, full condo design as well. So yeah, it's a passion of mine and it keeps me going. Oh my gosh. And in Calgary too, what a great place to do that because I feel like 
that's a place that has everything. So you want like city life, you got that. You want farm life on the outskirts. So it's like really you could probably tie in so many different things in that space. That's so cool. So many things. Yeah. 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 I didn't start in Alberta either, but I went there and same thing. So we probably have a lot in common because I also mm-hmm. was with the first husband. We were in Alberta and I left and now I'm in BC with my soon to be next husband. And that's so amazing. Yeah. Good Congratulations. For, uh, thank you. Thank you for for um understanding what's like small town move to like Alberta life is like it's Alberta has such a beautiful community. I will say like, Mm -hmm. I've never felt anything more like Kelowna is great. Don't get me wrong, but everyone's like doing their own thing. It's like hustle, hustle, business, entrepreneur. Like I'm sure Calgary's like that too, but just like right now. Well, I mean, I mean, right now might be a little sensitive for those in yeah. in Calgary because the flair the, the Oilers are <laughs> the, the Stanley Cup, but it's a Canadian team, you know. I'm from the I mean, island, right? We're so, we're I'm, jumping on the bandwagon. We are being as supportive to. as we can, right? Yes. Team Alberta, all yes. the way. So. Yes, this, this is all that yeah. matters. Like, man, I I I had to cheer on Canucks my whole life, being from the island. So like, I'm just so used to it. bandwagging to the other Canadian uh, <laughs> teams. So like, as long as it's Canadian, right? And it's as long right, as it's, and it's oil too, right? It's like huge, like my um, my future yeah. husband's in oil and gas as well. So he okay. uh, works up in Grand Prairie. So that's where he actually is oh, right nice. now. I think he's on like day 23 or oh. something. He's home next week or something like that. So oh, yeah. cherish the time. Hey, oh, my gosh. Yes. Canada is going to be so much fun for multiple reasons. Um, but anyway, no, so back, <laughs> back to this. So I love that you said you said you started in corporate. Can we talk about yeah. that a little bit? Like, so what, what yeah. did you do in corporate? Um, So I was in a camp manager. I worked for a I would say a top fortune 50 company. Um, and so worked my way up the ladder, started in Saskatoon, was transferred out to Calgary. Um, you know, a fantastic opportunity to be able to grow and just excel and basically become self-sustainable in my own environment. Right. That was a massive, massive thing as, you know, as everybody starts to understand my childhood and growing up and the marriage that I was in to be able to have, you know, a job and a salary that could support myself without needing anybody else. It was um, a lifesaver for me. And that's such an important thing that you say. And I think that's one thing that people discredit when they talk about corporate, because it is sometimes when it's not your heart's desire, I totally get it. I've been in corporate where it's not. I'm in corporate cannabis right now. So this is like every day I'm like, yeah, what's next? Right. So it could be really draining, but it does give you so much when it comes to learning about yourself and your interactions Mm -hmm. with people and what to take personally and what to not. So I imagine we'll get into, and like you said, that there's probably reasons why you went to that. And I would probably emanate that that's the same for me because I needed to take control. And I felt like my corporate job was something that I could control because I didn't have children. Not that you should control your children. I'm not saying that, but like, I was like, what is mine? What's my project that no one can take away from me? And you're right. Like that position is usually, I mean, of course there's you still could get fired, but it's, um, yeah. it's, it's super interesting when we start to evaluate the choices that we made, we're like interesting once we start to unravel. So mm-hmm. now we're coming into being an author. Is this your first book? This is my first book. And cool. I, it's funny because I told my husband that I was going to write it and he was just like, you know, when we, we got together, if I, if you would have told me that you'd be a published author, I would have like been the most shocked person ever. So <laughs> So, but it's, it is an honest, honest story. And I think, um, I think nowadays it's, it's a story that needs to be told. And I think there's so many women out there that share in very similar instances. Um, and I hope it inspires them to tell their stories too. Absolutely. And I think you'll inspire people not only just with your story, but also being like, my husband even was like, you're going to be a published author. Like you can absolutely do whatever the fuck you want to do That is like the baseline to that. And I feel like you're going to be a very, like, that's a reoccurring theme in your story is like, Mm -hmm. you might be told or put in a different way. And you're like, no, that's not it. I'm going to do this. Not saying that your husband's like, you can't do it. But like, I'm sure there's a little side of you that was like, hmm, motherfucker, watch me. <laughs> like, right? You know? yes. <laughs> like, a little yes. bit inside subconsciously and not a, yep. like shade. We need that out of our spouses a little bit to like stoke that fire in a positive way. So that's amazing. Yep. So it's coming out in, in this fall. So could we talk about that a little bit and, and little amp it up or where, where people be able to find it and when yeah. is it going to be out there? So it comes out September 24th and it's going to be available on Amazon, Indigo Chapters, Barnes and Noble, all of the main distributors. Um, and I'm going to do some extra work on local uh, appearances, book signings, um, a book launch party, all of that kind of stuff. So I'm so excited. 
That's so cool. If you come to Kelowna, please tell me. I want to be all a part of it because I will be yes, right there. Ma'am. First person signing. I was like, where's the book? Give I me would... the first copy. I need it. I, <laughs> I've had, I love um, it. You're my second author. Mm-hmm. And uh, I bought her book not only to support her, but it was more about like those that are getting explants um, for their breast implants. And for me, it was mm-hmm. just like, I've never had them, but wanted them. So I really related to a lot of the stuff in the story. And yeah. I think that's one of my favorite things is that you might not always have the same story, but you can learn so much from other people's stories that could relate right. to you. Right. And I think that's yeah. huge. And I completely agree. I find that like, I'm always out looking for people to be on the show. And I mm-hmm. find there's a couple topics that are very difficult, which completely understandable to have people on because they're just not yeah. ready. And your story is one of them. And another big one is plastic surgery that like right. that didn't work out. That one is really, really yeah. hard because I think that's like, the external kind of like visible abuse kind of thing. And then this this one that you have gone through is like not necessarily always as visible. So the obedient daughter is the title. Do we want to start Mm -hmm. with like why that came to, and maybe that probably has to go back to your story probably a little bit. Yeah. So the obedient daughter, I guess, Oh, coming up with the title is like naming a child, right? Like it is the most difficult, um, thing. And so I I had so many in the works, but this one had always stuck. And it was one that I first came up with two years ago and I just kept coming back to. Um, And so my editor actually said, she's like, no, that's the one. So after reading my story and understanding and that sort of thing. And so to give, um, you know, the listeners kind of a synopsis of the book, it is a, it's a memoir. It is a childhood um, abuse, sexual abuse story. So I grew up in a family. Um, I wouldn't say we were close knit by any means. Um, I had two older brothers and one of my brothers was actually uh, my abuser. So he sexually abused me for eight years from the ages of five until 12. And um, it was extremely tough. I guess at that same point, while I was so young, I had no idea that that's exactly what it was. So I'll get to how it kind of developed and how I understood it later. But um, my mom was actually my abuser's um, supporter. He was her favorite. And so she suffered from borderline and narcissistic personality disorder. And so that kind of created a completely different aspect to a household and the abuse that I was facing. Um, To get away from that whole dynamic, um, I ended up marrying an abusive husband because at the time he was a lesser of two evils, three evils, right? Um, So it kind of takes you through um, my journey to healing, to acknowledging how that affected me as an adult, how it came about. Um, And my goal to be nothing like my mother to provide self-awareness to my children, to do everything absolutely different than her. And so, um, yeah, it's been quite a journey, but I feel like I'm in a very, very good place to be able to share with the world. And that's, that's the part where I was just like, oh gosh, girl, like I want to make sure that I'm framing this properly and making sure I'm supporting you. And you're immediately like, don't worry, I'm here. And I was just like, oh, this is so, so I hate that I have to be like, I'm excited to talk to you and things are amazing. But usually when someone's sharing their story is when they're at that part where they're ready and they're going to take that fuel as fire to help everyone else. So um, I'm one, obviously extremely sorry that that you've obviously had to go through that, even though I'm sure you've heard that and it's, it's surface maybe level coming from me, but I just, I feel the family part is so hard because you're five. Like yeah. you didn't, I'm sure you didn't know that. Was that your oldest? So you had two older brothers and that was the oldest of the two? So he was my middle brother. He oh, the was middle the brother. closest. Okay. So my oldest was eight years older. And because there was oh. such a drastic difference between the two of us, um, he was very removed from it and, you know, was supportive. But at the same time, we were never close until much later in life. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So I have the same gap. Uh, well, both. I have 12 age gap with my two younger brothers. So I, I have a, t- yeah, I was 12 and they were born. So 12 and 15. So yeah, I completely yeah. understand where it's more like, and because I was a, a girl and my mom and stepdad needed help, I would take on the role yeah. of parent more than anything, yeah. but I could see as a boy, you're like, fuck this kid. I'm out of here. You know, like yep. you know, well, uh, that's a big age gap to kind of care as a, as a boy at that weird age. So I could see where it's like your family. I get that where it's like your family, but you're not family in the same way. Right. And then I'm sorry to you that like the other part of your family was 
not what family is either. And sorry, was your dad present in this? Yeah, so my dad was present. Um, but if you know anything about borderline and narcissistic personality disorder, it kind of creates this overshadowing gloom over the entire family. Um, and it's typically something where everybody is walking on eggshells. Um, you know, there's massive outbursts of emotion, there's control, there's jealousy issues, there's impulse issues. Um, and so, you know, as I can look at it now and I can see that my dad, as supportive and as loving as he was to me, he was also under that umbrella of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and so extremely difficult for him as well. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't blame him. I don't, there's, there's nobody that I blame um, at this point. I've gotten to a point of forgiveness and, you know, it's just something that um, if, if those kinds of things never happened, I wouldn't be who I am today. Isn't so. that wild when you get to that point and then you go through something else and you're like, okay, I know I got to go through this. It sucks. But it's just like, it's that understanding that like, once you get there, you'll know. Right. And and yeah. it's different for everyone when it comes to healing. So you said from five to 12 is like, is that the main type of time of abuse? And then at 12, did you, is that when you went to meet your husband or like, that's when it kind of stopped because you turned into a teenager? Yeah. So at the age of 12, um, the final piece that kind of resonated with me that stuck with me, um, was actually a rape. And so that for me was, um, you know, thankfully the last moment that I had of abuse. Um, but it was almost like after that, he kind of was able to move on to girls at high school. Um, so it allowed me the freedom. I was off the hook and, so yeah, I was so grateful for that, um, that that's when it stopped. But for me, even at that point, right, because of those instances, as I started dating boys and, you know, all of these kinds of things, it still stuck with me, right? It was still mm -hmm. something that I felt obligated to, you know, please boyfriends that I was with, you know, promiscuity stepped into place, lack of self-confidence, you, your self-worth basically just dwindles to nothing, right? It is, Absolutely. and you just you hang on for it. And I'm, I'm absolutely positive that if I didn't have such a strict mom in a way, I probably would have turned to drugs, um, or rebel in that sort of way. Um, so I can look at it that way as, as insanely as it was to be able to have her as a mom. I know she kept me in the straight and narrow because of it, mm, which is, is like twistedly fucked up. That is right. Like it's, yeah. Well, it's like, hey, you're giving me so much abuse, but like, I'm also afraid to do anything wrong. So I'm going to stick into this and not rebel, which in a way is probably positive because those parents that don't care, don't have a, a, a disease or illness like that yeah. or behavioral stuff like that, they don't care. So then they go off the rails, which it's like yeah. either one, not great, but one maybe is like you said, set you up with a little bit more structure and the inability to act out, which in turn, like you said, probably saved you of a life of who knows, like drugs yeah. and leave to what like 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 promiscuity maybe the streets maybe like becoming a hooker prostitution, like, prostitution. yeah like yeah. I, I feel like I'm not trying to be that way I do try to listen to a lot of interviews especially with those that are definitely have made it on the street and I swear majority of them start with abuse like and I it yeah. just makes me absolutely so sad because it'll be physical mental sexual and it always starts at those developing ages so like yeah I I just got shivers um it, it blows my mind how healed you like you are and how strong you are and how convicted you are in this. And I just like want to take a minute, just like, just like I said, you just immediately gave me chills, like good for <laughs> you for doing that because like, that is such a pivotal age. And I'm so sorry that the harshest thing was what stopped it. But gosh, like you said, fuck, at least that's it. Right. And then, yeah. but then you're at that age of just now trying to understand sexuality and to yeah. someone that wasn't, I wasn't sexually abused. I'd say that there was a lot of, um, pressure and talk about my looks. I was uh, the youngest, like I, I didn't have siblings, like I said, till I was 12. And I was um, born when my aunts were like teenagers, like 16, 17, 18. My mom was very young. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm growing up, they're growing up, you know, and they're in that teenage years and everything, you know, Playboy Bunny, like you were there, you're around it, you yeah. know, like we were a hyper, hyper, hyper sexualized group and yep. even with that and then being told that our value is in how many men we slept with and how many guys we're attracted to you go and you start collecting all these men and all these things and yeah. even just as someone whose like looks were very much discussed I struggled 
with not finding my value in sexual interactions. Yeah. I can't imagine growing up with having that understanding of that's what love is, yeah. is then being very fucking confused coming into that teenage years too. So like, can we walk through that a little bit of how that affected you as a teenager? Yeah. So I would say like my first boyfriend was my first real boyfriend, I would say was probably when I was 13 mm-hmm. and you know, my brother throughout all of the abuse had positioned to me as that this was teaching moments, okay. right? So these were, you know, the abuse, um, the hand jobs, the, you know, all of it was a teaching moment for me, right? So that I could take that and learn with anybody else, right? But at that point, I hadn't French kissed a boy. And so for me, I was a little confused that that was not first and foremost topic priority, right? So like if, if I'm learning, yeah, right? These, me how these to ride the, a bike. Like, totally. These are the things I'm nervous about. This is what's giving me anxiety. And so, um, you know, and obviously I can see it now that it was more of a grooming process that was totally. to his own advantage. But um, as I stepped into it, um, you know, when I first lost my virginity, I was 15 and it was for an older boy. It was, it was with him and he was two years older than I was. And it was, you know, of that obligation standpoint, right? Like this is just what is expected of me. I wasn't ready for it. And obviously I was still close in time frame to what had happened when I was 12, that it, it hit me in a way that I had no idea. I immediately retracted inwards and I just kind of you know, pushed him away. I couldn't be touched. I didn't want to be held. Don't hug me. Don't kiss me. Do like, just get away from me. And so I went through this moment in life where it was just, where I felt like I had no self-confidence, no self-esteem. And I was ashamed of what I had did. Um, And so I didn't have that motherly figure or anybody in that matter to sit there and say, it's okay. We all make mistakes you know, it's learning from them. You are still valuable. Um, you know, you don't have to go and sleep with another guy a couple of months later or six months later, whatever. Um, so it's, it really impacts. And so like, I look at that now and it's like the idea of speaking to our youth and our children about this kind of thing and holding them and themselves on a pedestal of value Um, and self-preservation and just being able to wait it out for whenever they're ready um, is massive. It's not talked about. And like what makes me upset is they have these like programs in school, you know, and I just don't feel like that gives anything to anyone. And same thing, like I was 16 when I lost mine and I was like late, like I felt like the loser. I was like, okay, um, well, you know, and like the sad thing is the guy who took my V card passed away. So I'm, I'm never going to take back that moment right. um, because, you know, it was a very special moment. I will always remember. I will never smell banana condoms the same. Let me tell you that we're all the hype back then. Uh, gross. We were watching Big Daddy and that was the big joke with the whole group was just like calling him, you know, and like, but I also was not prepared. But then like yeah. to your point is that's what we were sold was our yeah. value and it was important. And it was kind of like the more men you slept with, the more value you had. And as I'm coming into my 40s and really like looking back at all of my personal sexual trauma, I'm like, y- that's where it started is being told that at a young age. And then, like you said, like feeling like you just have to do that and that's your job. And you know what? It is a great act with the right person in the right time. Yeah. It's a beautiful yeah. connection. And I feel like, there's so many things that I've spoiled that, but especially like, you know, I feel like sometimes purity cultures ruined it for themselves because it's almost like too extreme. But at the same time, when you've been abused that way or see it, you're like, I get where they're coming from. Like, yeah. I really do, because that is a very strong connection at a very young age that we don't understand. We're just sold to like, it's just sex, like on the movies and Playboy. And it's like, be open and free. But there's so much more to that, that people like, I feel like maybe don't understand until they've had maybe a really negative experience. Right. Yeah. And that too, like when you talk about the V card and, and God, I think I was, by the time I was in grade 12, grade 12, I had three notches basically on my belt, three V cards of other guys that I had taken and I was labeled a slut yep. and it's exhausting. Like I had received a death threat in the middle of class because I took the V card of you know, a guy that, you know, she was now dating and they were upset and she had friends to support her. And it was just like this whole thing. But at the same time, it's like, 
you know, you have no idea what I've been through that it put me in that position either. So true. Yes. Every girl that we meet has someone, little girl broken inside that's trying to heal, right? Like 100%. And it all, it all manifests differently. And I think that's why our grace comes into place and conversation, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Instead of slut shaming, which like, girly, I was on the side of being a slut. I was a girl friend that was friends with all the guys. Like I was like, it was either I was in a committed relationship or yep. I was a slut. Like there was no one or the other. Like I couldn't just be because like, you know, you got to find the next man. You got to, you got to get, get out there, get yep. under, to get over one man, you had to get under another, you know? And right. so it's like. The already sex culture that there is is already kind of like so aggressive Mm -hmm. and then like you said to your point there's many women or kids that grew up with parents that didn't explain any of those things to them and then in your situation not only was your mom or dad not explaining that but you also had someone on the inside being like well i'm explaining it to you but gaslighting you because you like you said you knew that this this wasn't right and is that something that you felt like right off the bat did it like progress itself like started at five did it start like lighter and he groomed you over those seven years yeah it it went from you know like and i kind of go through and i explain everything in the book and and there's trigger warnings and such like that but um yeah it started from curiosity of taking a flashlight to you know my private parts when i was five to um you know rubbing bodies up and down saying that this is what sex is right to um, exposing me to pornography for the very first time, um, to, you know, showing me nude magazines, videos, um, to hand jobs, to, um, anal sex basically. And so it came to the point where at that final point, it was saran wrap that was wrapped around him. And he said, it won't even touch you. And so at that moment, yeah, you know, I felt like, it it was obviously painful. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was something that I wasn't okay with. Um, you know, but he followed up with, you're not going to tell anybody. Right. And so it most definitely was something that everything else I kind of just pushed away and pushed aside because it didn't make sense to me. And it really wasn't until, um, I would say in 2020 when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. Right. And I find that everybody was kind of in the same place. It got, quiet, right? The noise of life and everything got silent and we had to sit within our own thoughts and the noise of all of our inner traumas and that sort of thing, or our marriages that weren't working out or, you know, fertility issues, whatever jobs, exactly. Um, kind of came to like this abrupt boiling point and we couldn't, we couldn't, say goodbye to it anymore. We couldn't stuff it down. And so that's exactly what kind of happened with me. And it um, presented itself as symptoms of MS. So. Wow. That's huge. So let's, okay, let's go, let's get ourselves to there. So um, you graduate from um, school, obviously in Saskatoon. And did you stick around there? Did you go to school there? Did you, did you go right to your job? Yeah, no, so I went to university and I got a degree. Um, I ended up traveling down to Las Vegas um, and I stayed there for two years. Um, so the the gentleman that I was dating at the time was playing hockey. And so we traveled there. We ended up coming back, um, you know, got engaged, got married and started working shortly thereafter. So, And through all of this, had you kind of, so 2020 is when you kind of realized that maybe that wasn't right. But throughout time, did you revisit that kind of part of your, of your life? Or did you just kind of close it into a container and was like, you know what, this is the past. I don't need to deal with this. And then, like you said, 2020, it was just like the mirrors were put up to everybody. Right. And any, like you said, anything that you couldn't face, you're either going to face it or you're going to get worse and in, in avoiding it, I think is yeah. probably fair to say for most people. Yeah. So it was always something that kind of reared its head, right? It wasn't necessarily the seven years prior to that. It was that one instance that, you know, kind of bubbled. And for the most part, it would be um, triggered by sexual experiences a lot of the time. Or if I saw, you know, say Game of Thrones, for example, and I think in one of the very first scenes and episodes, um, there was an instance of a brother and a sister, Right. And so that triggered me. Right. So, so, so certain instances like that, that, you know, would affect me, or if I had somebody behind me, I would be affected by that way. Um, So, so yeah, 
it, it would be something that I would try and just bury down. I would just keep pushing it down and pushing it down. And yeah, COVID, it was just like, nope. No way. You're, <laughs> you're not doing it anymore. <laughs> We're done. You're done. <laughs> okay. It's time. Yeah. And that's yeah. fair. I mean, you can, I think universally, it's just, they know when it's time, right? It's like, yeah. you're strong enough to like, it's maybe going to be very close to breaking you. But if you carry on any yeah. further for whatever reason, like you said, now it manifested into a physical illness, which I have heard so many people say when they've regressed and held on to something traumatic. And I feel like, um, Personally, in my life, there's someone also that has a pretty bad physical ailment, and we 100% believe that it's from trauma as a child. Yeah. And so when you said that, it just very much validated that feeling, and that's super scary, especially when you're going through all these testings, trying to figure out what's mm -hmm. medically wrong to find out that, like, well, if you get prescribed these medications, that's not going to be the right thing. Um, and yeah. so did that happen to you in 2020 when this all kind of came out? Yeah. So, you know, my limbs were going numb. I was having issues and that sort of thing. And so a lot of tingling, numbness. Um, and so I went through the full scope of testing um, with numerous specialists and doctors and CT scans and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then basically my GP shifted me to, oh, well, you just have depression. Let's just put you on some, you know, SSRIs. You'll be fine. Like just you know, start to work out a little bit. Let's get you a therapist. And I was like, oh, okay. And Perfect. so, right. I, I went through that program and then one therapist turned to another therapist. Um, and then that therapist turned into, um, another one. And so it was my second therapist actually that she said, and right during COVID there was such a shortage of therapists because everybody was, you know, using them and reaching out to them that, um, this was the Alberta health um, allotted 12 sessions or whatever they give you. Yep. And so that one therapist said to me, I'm going to give you permission. I want you to go and I want you to dig deep between now and our next session. I want you to go as dark as you can go deep down and find anything that has happened to you as a child that you think may have caused any sort of depression. And she was actually the first person in my life that ever gave me permission to go deep and go dark. And it was something that I thought, I'm like, no, I'm just going to bury that shit. Like, yeah. I don't want to bring, I'm not going to bring it up. It's like, over. It's yeah, over. no big deal. Yeah. And so Name that, <laughs> right, that I was just like, okay, all right. And so I did exactly what she said. And within three or four days of sitting in my deepest, darkest depression of understanding that this moment that had been waking me up for the last two or three years, every single morning, this rape that was going through my head, it was the first thing that popped into my mind that I just kept pushing away. I acknowledged it. And then as soon as I acknowledged it, it started to unravel with everything else that had happened before. And so I came back to that next session and I told her and she was just like, oh my God, like shit, I got some skills. <laughs> She's probably, and you know what though? Like you, she obviously inspired you and, and, and made you feel like an iota safer than you did to be able to explore that. And you yeah. obviously made you feel like that was time too, right? Like yeah. maybe had someone asked you that before, maybe you wouldn't like, you know, I remember one time I was sitting with a therapist they're like, pretend your dad's right across from you. What would you say? I'm like, I couldn't even look at the space that yeah. that person was talking about. I was like, that is no, that's dumb. I'm not doing it. Like, yeah. this is so stupid. Like, and it was because I couldn't even like look in that because I could very well picture that individual there and I had no desire to, right? And you're just like, right. not ready to now. I have no problem doing it all the time, right? But there's yeah. certain times and you know, and yeah, like you said, I think COVID, it was kind of a situation where most people are like, shit is going to change and I got to yeah. change, like whether yeah. you know what that is or not. And so when then she's like, okay, we found it. Am I able to help you? Or did she pass you on to somebody that's maybe more specialized in, in the issue? <laughs> yep. She passed me on. She's like, I don't specialize in childhood sexual abuse. So I'm going to shift you over to somebody else. And uh, so then, yeah, it kind of worked his way. But prior to that, I would say that... Um, it was like my husband and I, we had hit the point of we're either cutting and running because this, mm. you know, my trauma and everything that was going on with me, my first instinct was to push away. Yeah. Right. It was to protect myself. Don't tell your secret. Don't say anything about it. Just go on living life as best as you can. Mm -hmm. And so it had gotten to the point where it was, 
a mere few days after my realization about everything. And at that point, I was just like, nope, I can't, I can't share this. I have no intentions of sharing it. Um, but then, you know, we, we almost broke down and we almost broke up and, and destroyed our family. And he asked me what was going on. And so I, I opened up and I told him and he was the first person that I told. And as I told him, it was like, you know, in those insane movies where you've got thousands of bugs flying out of your mouth. Yes. It was a visceral feeling exactly like that. And it was like this poison had just, you know, bubbled up and came out and it was so freeing mm. to be able to tell one person, yeah. anybody about it. And so, yeah. Um, after that, she moved me on to another therapist and we had worked on, you know, the life story, understanding it, um, and then did a number of sessions of EMDR, mm, yes. Uh, yes, which was extremely helpful. Good. And uh, and then I topped it off with a hypnosis session just to be able to, you know, really put the cherry on top and make sure we got it all. And yeah, and, uh, yeah I've, it was life changing. That's amazing. So would you say that majority of what you went through was, let's say, practices and services? Or would you say that was there any medications that help you feel like you were given SSRIs, but did you end up utilizing those much, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I, I would say that they allowed me to numb out a little bit, right? It They just kind of take the edge off more than anything. And I'm not a massive drinker. And so for me, I just, it was a way to be able to have a little bit more energy and to just live in a happier state. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say that they worked for the interim, but more than anything, I think just being able to speak up and tell, you know, your story and tell the truth and release it was the ultimate freeing. Yeah. I think for the, fair to say where you're probably holding a lot of shame where it was yeah. just like, because you were probably telling yourself because you had no one around you saying it's not your fault. This whole time you're thinking it's my fault. It's something I did. So you're hyper and analyzing everything about yourself so that you don't get put in this position again. And if you do, you're like, well, it must be me because it was me the first time. And then finally someone's like, hold on, sister. That's yeah. not true. Other yeah. people are treating you like shit and it's so easy. And I'm sure you pointed out with all people around you. I'm sure you do not let your friends or, you know, anybody, your coworkers, let's say, uh, uh, take that type of abuse. But for yourself, yeah. you're just, you know, programmed as at an early age without zero support. Um, yeah. And to and to the point with, with your dad, too. I just want to say mm -hmm. this. I hear this from people a lot where it's like, my dad wasn't necessarily a bad dad, but he didn't do the things that he had to do. And yeah. I feel like that's also detrimental to a child as well, right? Where we're... we're and, and, and not that that's their faults because they're usually victims of some sort of abuse. Right. But right. I hear that a lot with like alcoholics, you know, like yeah. I come from alcoholics and it's like, well, why wouldn't, um, you know, let's say like my, my, my stepmom say anything to him. Like, why would like, yeah. you know, just actually regressing with my mom yesterday and remembered that I actually got pulled over with my real dad. Um, he got a DUI and my mom didn't find out about it until it was in the paper. He went to jail and got his license taken away allegedly. Um, and I was wondering why I'm so afraid of people drinking and driving. Like I know why, yeah. but like any sort of like getting bent or any things I like super panic. And it's like, well, because my real dad put me in that position, you mm -hmm. know? And then like, I would look at my like stepmom, like, why didn't you say anything? Like what? Yeah. Well, because she was drinking too, you yeah. know? So it's like, there is some people that you can excuse because they are part of the abuse. And some of them are like literally creating it as well. So I, I right. get that. And I feel like it's yeah. hard too, because you're like, I love you. You're a good person, but you didn't stand up for me the yeah. way that I needed you to. Is that fair to yep. say? Yeah, I would say it was, um, you know, I speak very openly in my book about, you know, the, the hands of abuse that my brother had, um, you know, the control that my mom had over me, you know, I was very much a cleaner. Like that was my job. I was like a maid basically, as we say, and my dad actually, you know, as kind and as sweet as he is and, you know, as abused as he was as well, I was put in the position of therapist for him. Yeah. And so I had convinced myself and right. I, he enabled me to be able to give him advice. I knew everything about their marriage. I understood, um, you know, the things that she said, did the things that he wanted, you know, we both had this, you know, per dream perception of what the perfect family would look like. And we understood that it wasn't our family, but we both wanted it. And so I had always told him and tried to convince him to just pick up and leave because if he left, then he could take me 
-hmm. right? And I would be free of her and free of my abuser and we could go and be that happy family, Um, you know, but he was loyal to a fault and, you know, the perfect prey for a narcissist. Yes. And you know what? That's so, and I hate to say timing, but I feel like timing has a lot to do where it's just say like, I think our parents are still at that bridge. Like my parents did get divorced, but it was very like not good then. Right. And not that I think everyone yeah. should just get divorced. I, I am, I am a woman of divorce and a child of divorce. So I do think it yeah. should be on the table, but I think that we need to take marriage and relationships a lot more seriously, um, mm-hmm. and heal this stuff so that we aren't picking the people. Cause same thing. Um, I didn't come from safe, so I chose safe, which right. was not crazy love that I thought I deserved or that was out there. I was like, but this is safe, you know, and right. no shade to Steve. I've said it on this show. I have no shade deck, Steve. We're happy. You're happy. Um, yeah. but just not my guy. Right. But I did definitely yeah. same thing married because I wanted what I wasn't provided in childhood and that was foundation Mm -hmm. and safety and that's not what I had my parents were divorced and remarried and I got passed around three different parents all the time and I didn't have like structure in a home Mm -hmm. like I had homes and I was but you know what I mean like I was oh at this house at that house at this house passed back and forth all the time so that's what I searched for not realizing that I was searching for that because of childhood lacking I thought that's just who I loved and then I was like in the marriage and I was like oh oh is which a, is which is pretty admirable, on. though, for you to be so young and to be able to find what it wasn't that you received, right? Like so many of us, and, and myself included, always go towards what we know, yeah, right? And so for me, my first husband was exactly that. He was very similar to what my mom was and, you know, had just gotten to the point like, infidelities, you know, just lack of trust, red flags. Like there were so many red flags that... I could have just collected them like every shade and did I ignore them? 100%. Every single one of them. I was just like, this is the lesser of evils. Um, it's my ticket out of here. Yeah. And so he actually never knew anything about my abuse. Um, there was, I, he still, I like, I'd be surprised he doesn't know now. So it's, he's gonna, he's gonna, (laughs) he's 24. He's gonna. And so I hope that there is a little bit of understanding for him in that as well, that totally. we were not perfect for each other. Um, you know, and by any means I was not perfect in that marriage either. Um, but he wasn't, and no. he wasn't perfect for me. And, you know, we're both kind of remarried and doing our own thing. And, you know, I hope that he's happy, but at the same point in time, I hope he would understand some of the choices and decisions that I made because, of the abuse that I've been through. And that is so important because I think even if you've healed from it, he's healed from it. I think there's always going to be open-ended questions to any sort of divorce or relationship ending. And I think just for yourself and and whether he wants to do that or not, it might be healing for him to be like, oh, this is why she reacted this way. And I think when I went into my second relationship, now going to my second marriage, it was so important to communicate even if it hurts because I felt like that's not something I could do in my last relationship. And not because like he just wasn't like, emotionally like I am you know like it was just yeah. kind of like yeah you know where my one spouse now is like well I might not understand all of your emotions but you can tell me about them if that's what makes you feel better I'm like thank you just listen you yeah. know like yes and it's just nice to know that okay like yeah you were a dick but you know there was probably some sp- spaces that I was reacting to and I had zero awareness like I always talk about this on the show so sorry guys you're here again but I always realize like you go back to certain things like fighting about the dishwasher well, that stems back to when I was a kid and would get yelled at about not doing the dishwasher properly. But here I'm ripping Grant's face off and want to like give him an uppercut. And I'm like, I feel like this isn't this situation, you know, and when you don't have any awareness to any of it and you don't know yeah. because your family is pretty much telling you like this is how family is and you didn't see really anything yeah. different, you're going to have zero awareness to how you're reacting. And fair enough until, like you said, it it faces the mirror. So hopefully that's yeah. some thoughts for him to revisit for himself and maybe some some forgiveness he can give himself to for being like, okay, maybe there was some times that it wasn't me, but, yeah. Yeah. but most time probably was. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to shade and tea on this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do have a question though. So you did, when we were talking, you were saying, you know, that your mom is obviously the abuser's enabler. So mm-hmm. there's someone very close to me that has kind of similar situation. And they said that they went to, you know, mom and dad and explained this. And it was pretty much like, you're lying. Is yeah. that a similar situation to you as well? Um, no, actually. Well, yes and no, I would say. So, you know, I obviously told my husband the first, um, and then my dad was the second person I told. And, you know, it had been 
a number of years where I had just, we had grown apart, my brother and I, and obviously it was just, I had always told him, I said, we're never going to be close, you know, et cetera. And so I called him one day and my dad have always, we've always been close ever since then too. Um, but I said, you know, do you recall how I've always said that I've, I'm not going to be close. And I said, well, this is the reason why. Mm -hmm. And, um, my dad, I know at that moment that I physically broke a part of his heart. Um, you know, he burst into tears. He was angry. He apologized profusely that he was not there, that he did not protect me, that he did not put in a stop to it. Mm -hmm. Um, he was everything that I had expected him to be and more. Um, and so, after that, um, I told him, I said, at the point, like, I have no intentions of telling mom, like, let's not, let's not even go there. Because I know, I, I knew what her reaction would be, right? So I'm like, if we just, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. Like, we're not gonna, this isn't gonna be a thing. Yeah. And so, and it's funny, because like, right at that time, I was like, I'm not a victim. I'm not a survivor. Like, I, I didn't, this Still is- Still in it. Yeah. I was like, yeah. this doesn't define me. Like, we're not, this isn't a thing. And so I spoke to my oldest brother after that, um, he came out for a visit and I just said, you know, this is the situation. He was very upset. Obviously he, you know, was trying to punch things and like all the things, all the boy things, boy all reactions. the boy things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Once again, he apologized for not being there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so my dad eventually had sat with it for a week and he said, I can't keep this in. I have to, I have to tell her. And he's like, this is just, this is breaking me. And I, you know, I knew at that point, it's like, okay, I get it. Like I've been living with this for decades. I can't expect you to do the same. And so he ended up telling her and um, she took three days to call me. And I thought she would have picked up the phone immediately or the next day or just mm -hmm. whatever. She took three days to call me. And when she did, she said, well, don't you think we should finally talk about this? And she said, start from the beginning. So I told her everything and she goes, well, why the hell didn't you just say no? Uh, and so there's a big chunk of her brain thought process missing. No offense. Yeah. So that was extremely tough to have to deal with, to hear that. Um, and then, you know, as I've, I've understood borderline and narcissistic personality, like it took me, Gosh, I had just had my first daughter and I learned about it through therapy myself. And it was just like mind opening. So for 10 years, I had sat there and tried to understand what she would say. And so I knew she would start to bring it back to herself. And she did. And so she basically brought it back to herself. And she told me that something similar had happened to her as a child with her older brother. And none of it, it was a one-time thing. It was nothing like I, I shouldn't say it was nothing. It was, it was not as serious as what had happened to myself. Um, yeah. but it ignited me in a way that I said to her, how could you not tell me about that? How could you not have an instinct to protect your own daughter from that happening to you mm -hmm. or to myself? And so we ended up going through this, it, I call it the intervention in my book mm -hmm. and it takes you through, um, the meeting that we had as a family. And so we drove back to Saskatoon and we all sat in my older brother's living room. And it was a point of presenting and acknowledging the abuse to my other brother. Mm -hmm. And he admitted everything. He apologized for it. He told me that it was something that um, had been stirring away in his own brain for the last number of years that he couldn't come to a point of, you know, acknowledging it or admitting it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, most people in every book that I've ever read has always said, don't ever, you know, confront your abuser after the fact. And so I was extremely nervous about that. But mm -hmm. for him to be able to acknowledge it and admit it in front of my family gave me that satisfaction, I guess, to say, yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't not believe me now. Yeah. Now what? He sat there and admitted everything. And so it was extremely tumultuous and just you know, traumatic in the sense of having to face all of that once more. Mm -hmm. We left and it wasn't shortly thereafter that um, my mom basically said to me, I'm done talking about this. You need to get back up on your horse and get on with your life. You've got two young girls and I'm, I'm over it. And so 
I was pretty shocked in that response. I thought it would have been an opportunity for us to have grown together, to, for her to show support, um, but it wasn't. She was over it. And so it, um, the last third of the book takes you through, you know, what kind of, what our relationship happened and the healing portion of it and all of the healing steps that I did and, and basically what happened to her in the end of, um, that series. Wow. That's, that's so, that's such a mind, um, trying to figure out how you get there. Um, um, I'm assuming it's just like a cognitive dissonance thing where it's like, I don't really want to acknowledge that this was happening under my house. Yeah. So I'm essentially not going to, and we're just going to move on. Cause you're fine. You look fine. Yeah. You're fine. So let's just, I don't want to unpack this or deal with this because yeah. obviously I've got my own baggage on top, on top. And like you said, sometimes you do the exact same, or you do the exact opposite of how you were yeah. raised, right? Whether you're knowing it or not. And obviously you know, and I feel like I hate to say that a lot of that generation above are just very mm -hmm. like, shut it in a box and it's not important. And right. a lot of them, it makes me feel really sad that they're taking this shit to the grave yep. and that they're never going to heal it. And I hope that there's lots of pride within yourself to just fucking face that. I read yeah. something today that actually made me think of, of you. It's just like, there's always going to be that one person that has to take the general generational trauma the hardest. And yeah. that's when we decide that the abuse stops. And I yeah. feel like that's half my mom, half me. And I feel like that's you within your story now stopping that completely for the girls. And I hope that empowers the fuck out of you to see that yeah. you did that over her, you know? Oh my God. It was, you know, oh God, I don't even know how old I was when I decided that I was going to be the best mom in the world. And that would be the opposite of what she was. Right. And I made it my life's goal to be the best mom and, and break the chain of generational trauma and to just give my girls what I had always wanted. And so I feel like I have stuck, you know, with that goal and I am succeeding in that. And I'm so proud of that. Um, she, yeah, my mom was a different beast and it just, yeah, that's all I can say, but it's, it's of your story, you know? Brought you to yeah. who she is, and you know we'll see. You'll find out in the book. Obviously, I'm excited to find out the future um, of what that looks like, right? And I just yeah. think it's for one for so many things. Like, dude, awesome, awesome for you for doing this. Like, not just for yourself, for your spouse, for your brothers, like both of them, the family, like to face mm -hmm. that. Like, and I think it's so important that you should listen to what you feel like, right? Like, there could be advice out there if it doesn't resonate, and you're like, yep. no, I need to talk to this. I need to get this out so that I can move ahead. Some people don't want to, and that's okay. To yep. me, it sounds like your mom, depending on what you believe in, might come back and still repeat some of these pretty shitty lessons if she's not going to do that now, but you don't have to, right? And you don't yep. have to put that on your girls, and you can show them, especially in a super sexualized world how to hold on to that beauty and worth and because you had that you know taken away from you at a time you're going to yeah. be extremely aggressive with that for her for them yeah. and I think that's so beautiful and for other people so maybe let's do some advice so let's just say someone else has had a, a somewhat experience from their family what would you suggest is the first steps um to them to start like healing would it be like journaling or reaching out to someone what would you say do you think well, first, before I say say that, I would say that um, regardless if you have been in a childhood sexual abuse instance, whether you have a parent or somebody in your family that has had borderline or narcissistic personality disorder, whether you have been impacted by domestic abuse, um, whether you are a victim of generational trauma that has preceded um, before you, Oh, or whether you're just wanting to speak up and, you know, let somebody know your story. I encourage you to read this book. Um, the more people, everybody that I've spoken to has in one way, shape or another have been affected by any one of these things. And I feel like it is so relatable to so many women. Um, and as far as advice, I would say um, speak up is the only thing that I can absolutely say. If it is not acknowledging your own inner voice from journaling or through therapy, um, or even just saying it out loud to yourself, releasing the demons and the trauma that is inside of you is an extremely powerful way to heal yourself and ignite it. And once you're able to acknowledge what has happened, um, then obviously going through the massive steps of 
Oh, I, I, I will tell you like a snippet of all of the things it has been like cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, um, which is reprogramming the memories in your brain and how they're stored in your amygdala. Um, hypnosis has worked really well. If it is not kickboxing, visualizing <laughs> yeah. and beating the shit out of a punching bag, yeah. I, very, very effective. Yeah. Um, I would say I've even talked to psychic mediums. Um, and so just being able to hear the words that you've always wanted to hear as a child, um, extremely powerful, but sitting in your own trauma, being able to acknowledge it and speaking it to even just one close friend, mm -hmm. I promise you that you will be able to find some sort of similarity because we've all been affected by it, which is extremely sad. It is absolutely. And that is so beautiful. And I think one of the biggest things too is like looking back at your growth, right? And and acknowledging and celebrating those wins too, too as you're healing, right? Like you now wasn't the same one that decided to read the book or write the book or the one that realized in 2020 that these are right. So you really, I think, have to take those wins and you really can go from like, hey, this is a closed box. I'm not dealing with it. I don't need to, to being like, okay, clearly I have to because it's manifesting and now an illness in my body because I'm not dealing with it, which happens, I feel far more than people want. And they're just unfortunately always going to allopathic medicine, which isn't always the, 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 the key, right? Like, yes, help. But like you said, there's, there's tools and there's things and stories that you have to rewrite for yourself that, you know, if you're being numb and again, no shade to anybody that has to take medication, but for myself, this is why medication didn't work because it numbed me to the point that I wasn't able to repattern yeah. things. And then when I came off, I was no better. I was like, this right. is almost worse because I stopped the tools that I was starting to learn because everything was numb. I didn't need them. And then I was like, yeah. Oh, I'm done with this. Cause I don't want to be on medication for the rest of my life. And that was a whole other world. Right. So yeah. Um, yeah. And I think having like grace with yourself too, right? I think that's probably pretty huge. Like uh, I'm sure you blamed yourself so many times and I bet you that, that, uh, that from your brother, maybe that would that be fair to say that when he acknowledged that, is that when like the shame and the like, oh, I did this, is that when it started to unravel a little bit or were you already kind of already there? Um, I was probably a little bit already there. Um, I think, I think just like the shame is, is unsurmountable. Like it is, it is a completely massive, um, just even convincing myself that, um, wow. I didn't have a part in it, right. That it wasn't okay. That, um, you know, I didn't have a say at five years, 12 years, whatever. Right. Um, that it wasn't the life that I wanted. So that was, exceptional to be able to understand that. And I think like I had read every single book that there is out there on childhood sexual abuse. And so being able to hear everybody else's stories, right. And understand that whether they are as similar to mine or as different as mine, or, you know, even more exceptional in, in regards to the, the amount or the time or the length or the severity of it. Um, it is, yeah. I think it is just, you find similarities in your trauma that you've been through and in other people and yeah. it you can share, right? And understand that it wasn't your fault. Um, none of it was your fault mm -hmm. and you are not to blame. You have no reason to be ashamed. Um, you are still a beautiful whole human being. Absolutely. And I feel like, and we didn't go over this quickly, but do you know any stats like around like child, like child abuse? Is that quite, and I think I put it in my question, it's not to yeah. downplay it. Is it a lot more yeah. common than, oh, because it's massive. I feel like with your book, it's like, even if you haven't, there's a very big chance that someone in your life has. So maybe by also reading this book, you can understand maybe someone that's not telling you yet, but you can see some telltale signs. So you can yeah. be understanding that maybe this person don't be like, are you a victim? And this is why like, no, no, no. But like, <laughs> I think it's just really good to be there to yeah. understand because then you can kind of see the signs so that when that person opens up, maybe it's not yeah. as much of a shock and you're right. able to like be there and support them. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Cause I, I read a stat the other day, actually, as I was reading through your questions and um, it was one thing. So 93% of cases of childhood sexual abuse are not brought to police or child welfare, which is insane, right? So sitting there and either most, most children are not bringing it up or not mentioning it until they're much older in life. Um, but if they do bring it up, believe your child, no. absolutely believe your child and remove them from that situation. Because I guarantee you, it has happened, it will happen, and it will happen again. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing too that I also found interesting was that ancestral relationships on average last seven years. And I was like, yeah. And so it is that time frame, like that five it six is, as they're starting to be it, people. It is that time frame. So when they are becoming openly curious to the point prior to puberty, that is the time frame that is most desired, I would say, for an abuser. Yeah, for a groomer to get in there. Just yeah. when their brain starts to like develop and they're like you said, curious, asking questions. And it's like, you know, and it's not I want to point out too, like, and I've said this a few times, like abusers aren't always just like these creepy bald men that are breathing no. down your neck. Like they're not all looking like Joe Biden. Okay. No. Like they, yeah. they're, they're very much people. And like, you know, and it's not just like we make the joke about churches and like pastors, but it's, yeah, it's, totally. it's not, it's, I feel like more often than not, it is close family friends. Mm-hmm. It's relation. It's, it's in the family because you're around them all the time. You're, you know, parents are busy, especially now parents are so fucking busy. Yeah. Like, and, and they just leave kids with kids because that's what you did back in the day, you know, and I'm not trying to yeah. be this way, but no. porn, I swear to God, porn ruins so much for kids yeah. because I feel like when it got in the hands at younger ages, then this stuff started becoming, yeah, of course kids yeah. are gross, but I do yeah. not feel like children were as like it's I can't believe I'm saying this sentence as sexually driven as they have been in the last like 20 30 years and I feel like that is the access to pornography because why the fuck would these kids unless they've been abused themselves understand this kind of stuff I mean maybe I'm crazy but that's how I feel I feel exactly the same way and I know there were statistics about um you know children that become abusers because they have a been abused, but I absolutely 100% believe that it is the access to pornography that is, you know, a main factor in that. Um, my, and, and here's another thing too. So my mother, um, she provided access to me, um, to my brother, because we were forced to bathe together and I was in grade five, my breasts had already started developing. So, so that was, that bit of it. So it's the access, right? And so it is access to siblings. It is access to pornography, to TV shows, you name it. Um, you know, and I think it is so important, um, to go back to your typical abuser. Mm -hmm. Um, I did read something that 80% of all sexual abuse happens in the home. And of that, I found it completely astounding that only 9% were fathers or stepfathers. It was 38% that were a male relative, so an uncle or a brother or a grandfather. So those were the three under that category. And so I think as you know, listeners, right, we need to be cognizant of that and teach our girls and our boys about boundaries and about consent and starting to have those conversations at a very early age and creating that favorite five people that they can go to at any given time about who they can trust and say, this person has touched me or this person, right. Be able to give them the autonomy to stand up for themselves. So it starts, it starts as a very, very young age. And those that are not taught it, they are not understanding it and they fall into that category. And that's such a good point that you brought up because I do want to bring something else up too that I feel is starting to change a little bit when it starts with consent. And that's early as like when you're forced to kiss and hug family members and people you don't know when you don't want to, and then you force them to do that so that they look like they're nice kids. But at the same time, you're kind of already telling them that their initial instinct that they don't want to do something. Now, again, of course, there's going to be people with disabilities and things like that, like socially that you're trying to get them to you know, learn how to work with maybe on the spectrum or something like that. You know, I understand that. But for the most part to me, if when you're pushing kids to like, you know, how they always, you leave family and they make you hug and kiss everyone. And you're like, I don't want to, it smells like alcohol. Like it's so weird. I have a very traditional family that way. Love you guys. Sorry. But you know, very like (laughs) Christian, like everybody's got a, and I'm just like, I was like, okay, bye. Like I, and I didn't bother me as much, but I know my cousin, it bothered a lot. And so I was just like, to me, that's where it starts when you're telling your kids, no, 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 hug yeah. and kiss this person you don't know, but don't you dare do that to strangers. It's like, how yes. about I just don't at it's all. Conflicting. So it's very yeah. conflicting. So I'm not should yeah. be like, give my kid, like ask my kid permission before you could touch them. Like there's a degree, right. but like if your kid is visibly uncomfortable, I think that yeah. is, is at least, a pl- and I'm not a parent, so I'm talking out of my ass. So, but I think it's a really good place to start the conversation yeah. to yeah. show them that you are a safe place. That if someone, anybody even in your like, like anybody but me or dad, like, or whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. like 
that that you can come and tell me and we'll work yeah. through if that's appropriate or not, right? right? And I think that's right off the gate. So it's like immediately if your parents are forcing you to hug and kiss people you don't like, and that's putting your head and then all of a sudden now your older brother, or your older uncle's doing something yeah. and then they're like, it's normal, it's family. And you're like, okay, because how the fuck do you know any different? Totally. And it, it always starts with like a test situation, right? There's always like, you know, they'll smack you on the butt and see if mm-hmm. that bothers you. A pinch and you're like, right. Yeah. Just, just a them? little, a graze or a little joke or whatever. And then it'll progress. Yeah. It'll just keep going and going and going. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not always family members. It could be a neighbor. It could be, you know, et cetera. Anyway. So it, it's really something that you just have to be super cognizant as a parent. And I think even the fact that you've got those, that awareness, right, to that being a moment that affected somebody else, right? You've got that, that I know, you know, if and when you have kids, that you will implement that as a priority as it is. Totally. Yeah. Because boundaries are hard as it is. And to teach yeah. kids that the respectful ones without being little shitheads, like, I get it. You can't, like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like, there's got to be a balance. But at the same time, like, you can't protect everyone. And I'm not, like, blaming anybody for, yeah. you know, sometimes shit just happens and you could do yeah. everything in your willpower. And sometimes it does happen. That being said, I feel like lately, because most people have to have, everyone's got to work, everyone's got to, you know, drop their kids off here in these sports. Like you just have to, you can't protect them, but Mm -hmm. I think it's the relationship between the two of you that you can protect and you can honor and have that is then going to, at least you can be like, you know, maybe, maybe you wouldn't have talked to your mom if she was a a safe space, who knows, right? Like, but at least it would have been nice for your guys's relationship that she would have been. And who knows what that could have changed, right? Like, yeah, it could have stopped it. It could have whatever, but like, it didn't seem like she really offered a place. This is why I hate fucking favoritism because it's like, you're too afraid. And then you immediately are like, I have no value in the family now because for multiple reasons. And Well, and it's funny because like, I know we talked about resources and, you know, Canada has always been, um, if you think about the kid's help phone, right? So 1-800-668-6868. And it was a number that I had memorized as a child and had considered calling and, but I was too scared to, right? Because her, the power that she had over, it was almost like I knew that I was going to get in trouble for doing that. And so, but you know, you can text it now. Yeah. You can, te- you can text, I think it's connect to six, eight, six, eight, six, eight. And so better resources like, now, but right. Still... And just being able to have the access to it, to be able to say, I don't have to say it out loud, but I can text it. Yeah. Yeah. Or even just know it's there for when the moment's right. ready. Right. And I think that's so important because that's exactly it. Kids just think they're going to get in trouble because they feel like it's somehow they, their fault or because they didn't say no. Like yeah. you said, like, Oh, well, why didn't you stop it? Like, bitch, I was five like and it didn't like you said it's not like all of a sudden he walked in and did something like the final thing it started yeah. small and you're right. don't know anything and that's your brother and you're doing things like you know out in the world and this is just how family yeah. is but if you're not exposed to that then how you know yeah. what I mean like I thought it was normal people had six different parents houses yeah. to go through no I'm just kidding I knew I was off but you know sometimes you just really don't know like the alcoholic stuff yeah. I thought my parents were just fun at that point and, and like as yeah. I grew up I was like oh this is a problem yeah yeah. Now it's a problem for me. <laughs> it It is, right? And it's like, if you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, mm-hmm. right? No matter what it is that you say, it's not going to matter. It's like, just shut up and get to cleaning and do your job. Let's move, let's, let's move on, right? Don't cause problems. Yeah. And yeah. that's such an important point that you say. And I feel like that's such a generational thing. Well, I went through this. So therefore anything that you went through kind of doesn't matter because I went through stuff and I'm fine. And then you want to turn around yeah. and be like, bitch, but you ain't fine though. Like you might think that you're fine, but you're not fine. You're not fine. And unfortunately people that I, in my personal opinion, if you don't deal with the mental and the trauma, it is going to manifest in the physical, whether, and I'm not saying all of it does, but I truly believe that if you do not deal with your shit and you don't take care of your health at the same time, so ignoring your health, you're not taking care of your basics. And then you're also not taking care of your mental health those paths are going to cross and that's Mm -hmm. when you get sick and to change those patterns when you're physically not well is so much more difficult I find. So I always encourage people like, like you said, whatever modality it is, if it's just talking out loud to yourself, if it's just having the thoughts come in, like you don't need to go to talk therapy and EMDR every single day tomorrow. You just need to acknowledge that there's something 
because sweeties we all have something and we all have to it amber's point everyone's got it differently so mm-hmm. i think it's good to learn from everyone especially the hard ones and having these hard conversations like and no point did i feel great about a lot of the things that you went through and told me but i'm so glad that you're in a space that you can say that because i know someone in my immediate group is going to take something away from this and go holy shit amber can do it i can do it and like, let's talk 100%. about for a second, like you're writing a book. Okay. So let's just go to that quickly before we end our conversation today. So how long has this been in the making? Like, was there a moment where you're like, I need to do a book so that no girl could feel this again. Is that like a moment that you had or someone suggested it? You know what? I feel like because I was told to keep it quiet, right? When I came out with my secret after keeping it inside 25 years and my mom basically said to me, this stays between our family. Nobody else needs to know about it. Um, it, it fueled from that point on of being able, like just, just being shushed, right? It's like, you keep that shit back inside you. Nobody else needs to know our perfect family can stay perfect. He can remain innocent. That's okay. And so that fueled my ignite to be able to say, okay, fuck that. I'm speaking up. I'm telling my story as embarrassing as it is going to be for her and him and all the things. It's still my story. And that's really when I embraced the survivor like impact and end aspect of it, that it's, it's my job to be able to say, this is what happened to me. And I turned out okay. And I worked through it and I'm going to prevent this from happening to my daughters. And so I just want to be able to inspire other women to acknowledge their healing, to acknowledge their trauma, and to be able to come out better and brighter on the other side of it. And so that's where I stand now with being able to share it with the world. Um, I'm extremely proud of it. It is a, a long read, but it is the whole read. It is unbridled. It is everything in detail. And um, I really hope it can be an inspiration to other women. Oh, I guarantee it's going to be. And even just like, besides that, like, how does it feel for you? Like, obviously you're not, okay, that's done. We're healed next. But like, you know, is it like it's opened up? I'm sure this whole new perspective, this whole new fire for you. Do you feel like this is kind of launching you into the next chapter of your story? I would say yes. Um, It's definitely something that I, I think because you carry it with you right? It's not something that you can just write it in a book and put it on a bookshelf and there it's deleted from your body, from your brain, from your memories. Um, It is something that um, I think as a survivor, you continue to grow. You still have triggers. You still have moments in your life that, you know, you can feel it affecting you. But it is at that point that you can take everything that you've learned and just being cognizant of you know, why it triggers you and how to get through that and take a deep breath and say, it's okay, you're safe. You know, nothing was your fault. You were perfectly happy and healthy, um, I think is a massive thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think I feel exceptional about it. And, you know, as I look towards, um, so specializing in children's design, I think, and I, I can see it now at the time, I couldn't necessarily see it, but it was creating a safe space for children, which is something that I never had. And so it was like this, gravitating moment that I wanted to inherently provide children a safe space by being able to, you know, create a serene environment for them, even if I couldn't impact their parents. Yeah. Um, I still wanted them to feel it. So, so yeah, it's, it's kind of full circle for me in that way. Absolutely. And I feel like everything, like you said, brought you to where you are now and you're just, you know, like so grateful and happy that you're here. And I just, I really encourage that for everybody listening always. I know it's always always easier said than done, but there's going to be a moment on your journey in a situation where you're growing through and the lesson is now changed to something else. And now it's like, how can I impact people? And I think that that's such, that's such a pivotal, pivotal moment in healing is like, how can I help others and inspire them? Because you know that that's exactly what you needed at the time. Right. And not only are you doing that through your book and your story, you're doing that through, you know, what you do in day to day. And you're not also letting either of those be your identity because you are so much more than that. You know, you're not just an author. You're not just a child of, you know, sexual trauma. You're a mom and an inspiration and a designer and you know like a thought provoker and a free thinker and all of those things right and I think we're so bad at wrapping ourselves or it's so easy to wrap ourselves into that label and not see anything else I know I've done it myself you know labels but we're just 
so much more than walking cucumbers, you know, like yes. w- there's so much more and we don't have to be who we were, or what's happened to us. We could be more. And Amber, you're definitely a fucking walking I- inspiration of that. So thank, thank you, you again, like for jumping in and asking me to talk. I don't want to talk too much more because I don't, not that I, okay, hold on. Let me rephrase that. I do <laughs> want to keep talking. I don't want to keep asking you more questions that will allude to answers that I want the listeners to come and listen to in your book. Um yeah. So by me saying like, I don't want to talk to you, but no, I just want, I don't want to be asking because I don't want to uh, have anything else. But again, reiterating that the book is coming out September 22nd, 24th, yeah, 24th, 24th, 2024. (gasps) So that'll be 12, 24, 24. Uh, 9, 24, oh, 24. 9, 24. Man, I'm bad at numbers. Oh, <laughs> 9, 24, hey, 24. Christmas Eve would be great too, but yeah. <laughs> no, we're not waiting that long. Bitch, I'm not waiting like that right? much longer. I was like, <laughs> September? I don't even want to wait till then. So um, what I would love to do is have you back on in season eight. Maybe, maybe 9, 24, 24 is going to be, no, I'm just kidding. We'll be, um, love it. we'll have you come back after the launch of it and share what that was like to launch your very first book and, and what that's all like. Obviously, if you come to Kelowna, please come here. Maybe we can have that live. Who knows? Yes, you can go I for a wine that. tour and talk about it. Um, Girl, you're talking my language now. Good. That's, yeah, it's so funny. I didn't even drink <laughs> wine until I moved to the Okanagan. Now I'm like, it's the only time I drink is the summer to go to wine tours because they're just so much fun. Um, I, I will but, never say no to the Sauvignon Blanc in the summertime. Oh, like, oh, it's just, so nice. it hits differently. It really it does. does. Especially in the Okanagan. You know what it's like out here. Mm-hmm. Um, but that being said, where can everyone find you um, for the current time um, to find where to get the book? You know what I mean? Like Instagram? Yeah. So I've um, kind of dripped little secrets on Instagram under um, my author page. So it's Amber Hayes author. Um, I also have Amber Nicole design if anybody wants any design tips or just to be able to see my work. Um, if they want to go to amberhayes.ca, um, I believe that's it, or ambernicolehayes.ca. Um, I've got a website there, which has got all of my specialties as far as speaking um, trauma specifics and that sort of thing. Um, if they have any interest and they can view the podcast there as well, I've got a link there. So yeah, I'm, I'm online and I'm I am ready to chat, but yeah, most definitely interested. If you do want to chat, um, feel free to Always. reach out anyway. And I would love to hear from anybody else that has been through something similar, um, as well as your healing journey or acknowledging it. Um, I think we are a special group of folks and we got to stick together. Yes. And you're, the ripple effect that happens from just every single interaction is so cool. There's always going to be someone that listens to this that's going to follow you from it and be like, for multiple reasons. That's what I love yeah. about this show. It's just like, you just never know the ripple and the impact that you make, but it happens. Even if you don't see it today, all of a sudden, like three weeks down the road, it's going to be like, oh, well, yeah. maybe not three weeks. Well, yeah, it'll be published by then. Um, and it'll be yeah. like, oh, I listened to it and thank you so much. And even if they don't say anything, you just know that there's seeds planted everywhere, um, yeah. whether that's someone of abuse, someone like I said, even in a relationship, I think it's important that you read this because if you know or not, there could be signs that maybe you don't see. And and even just yeah. today, I'm sure some people are going to be like, okay, well, this maybe makes sense. You know, like a lot of people will say in relationships, like not to side swipe a little bit, but like, let's just say you think, oh, I'm not good enough in bed. Well, that person has actually had sexual trauma and it has nothing yeah. to do with you at all. But yeah. because you can't talk because that person's not ready or you don't know, you end up breaking up. Maybe you're having a fight about not having sex when it really had nothing to do with either of your attractions. Yeah but there's something else in there, you know? So I think that's why it's so important to have these conversations so that you feel empowered in your relationship to be, be, again, don't just be like, are you a victim of, but you know what I mean? Reach out. Maybe if you think that might happen, maybe reach out to him and be like, how would I present this? What are some things to say? Like open the conversation at the end of the day. I think that's the biggest thing is conversation, whether yourself with someone, someone through it, a professional, And and we have Absolutely. had we have had an EMDR uh, therapist on here. There's one in mm-hmm. Kelowna, um, Ashley. So we've had her on there too. So I completely like you said. There's all forms out there. Just yeah. you just got to start when you're ready, and you'll know. No pressure. But yeah. we're obviously gonna have you back. Um, I promised myself ten seasons. I am just finishing season seven, it. so there's three. No matter what happens with it, I promised myself ten. So we'll definitely have you back in the fall. I'll I be a little it. bit more depressed because. You know, <laughs> just kidding. Seasonal affective disorder. Yeah, I got it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we definitely have to have more of these so that I don't get super depressed. But thank you so much again, Amber, for today. You guys, Aww. make sure you're following her. I am going to be talking about this. I'll be sharing the book as soon as it comes out September 24th. Thank I'm very you. excited. Thank you, Amber, so much. Until next thank time. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, of course. Bye. Bye. Thank you guys so, so much for the support. I cannot thank you enough for being here. 
If you like this episode and you want to hear more, please give me a follow at the Be Real Babe podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, and Pinterest. You can also find me on Facebook at the Be Real Collective. Until next time, guys. Bye.